Hello, everyone, and welcome to day three of this celebratory event. Um, we are celebrating the launch of our new print journal, Tarka. Uh, the Tarka journal has been around for a while. Some of you probably already realize that um, as an online offering. Um, but over the last several months, we've been working really hard to create um, what has turned out to be, uh, I, I'd like to say, uh, a very beautiful offering. Um, and so I'm here with one of the contributors and friend and faculty member of Embodied Philosophy, Mary Riley Nichols. Hello, Mary. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me. So glad. Um, so I invited Mary to to speak as a part of this uh, Facebook Live event because Mary, obviously, she contributed an article. I'm going to read a little bit um, from that article in a moment. Um, but Mary also has a, an approach to bhakti which really kind of highlights the the quality of bhakti that transcends any particular tradition or. Uh, you know, a particular lineage stream or religion, and 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 that really is the the spirit of of bhakti, and we can find bhakti then you know instantiated in a variety of ways in different cultures, in different contexts, in different traditions, and that's really uh, the kind of um, one of the beautiful aspects of bhakti that that Mary brings forth in her in her article, which is really more of a kind of poetic, almost a sutra like. Um, uh, contribution, and I'm going to read a few of them. It's very beautiful. Um, we decided because it was so beautiful, because it was so heart infused and and, and nectarian, oh <laughs> that we put it at the end because it's sort of like you know, save the best for last, as it were. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to read a few of the um, the sutras, and it's the the title of, of Mary's piece is 13 Brief Notes on Bhakti Yoga." And so I'm going to read um, a few of these, and uh, um, she includes in uh, these passages, um, uh, in these kind of sutra-like uh, passages, uh, various quotes, but I'm going to leave those quotes out and, and give you something to look forward to. So I'm just going to read the bits that Mary wrote herself. Number two is um, titled, Love is the Vehicle that Unites the Individual with God. Love is not different from knowledge. It is a different form of knowledge. Love is a kind of knowledge that is more subtle than thought. Trying to think our way into the unitive state, no matter how intelligent we are, is like trying to split the atom with a hammer. Number five, the heart is a doorway to the infinite. Right in the center of the chest, you are possessed of a handy threshold to the infinite. Breathing love into the heart opens the door. Your awareness easily travels outside with the breath to explore the shape-shifting world, then returns within to probe infinite inner space. The inhalation and exhalation are your spiritual footsteps. Every breath walks you back and forth across the threshold of the heart. You are always holding hands with the eternal. That's so beautiful. That's so incredibly beautiful. I'm going to actually have you read the last two, but I just realized, why, why am I not having the author read her own work? Um, but I'll read one more, and then I'll have Mary read the last two. Nine, bhakti is recognition of the love that permeates reality. We define it so narrowly, narrowly and then ask, where is the love? Love doesn't have to appear before us on the scale of a Wagnerian opera. Bhakti yoga is noticing the love emergent through the smallest and simplest everyday scenes. You look up and appreciate the beauty of autumn colors in the trees. A man plays catch in the park with his son. A groundskeeper works with pride at his landscaping. Two lovers stroll eating ice cream. Runners rhythmically glide by interspersed with cyclists. Pigeons are pecking the ground in front of a lady throwing them morsels. You stop at a cafe and smile with the, the stressed out barista, wishing her a great day. A bhakta actively recognizes the eternal hide and seek of love. Okay, I'm going to take my note out here and then I'm going to hand this over to Mary. Mary, will you read us um, 10, 12, and 13, um, the bits that you wrote? Okay, thank you. 10. Bhakti is returning the favor. 
universe endows us with reality in every cell of our being, clothes us in consciousness and makes us real, asking nothing in return. This gift of being is unconditional. Since it gives us the honor of being a person, when we choose to personify the unknown, we are at last simply returning the favor. The formless waits to be recognized, seen, known, and born into the world. And then 12, yeah, 12. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Bhakti, that's a good one. Bhakti yeah. con connects us with the eternal eros. Mystics teach the way of union through the natural intensity of romantic love. Love your chosen one as a lover. Aligning love with breath awareness quickly becomes an ecstatic practice. If you love your breath, you fall in love with your life. Whisper sweet nothings, the divine names, to the prana. With breath as vector, love plunges ambrosial arrows through the heart center. Being thus interpenetrated by consciousness with every inhalation and exhalation, one participates in the lovemaking between the finite and the infinite, the personal and the impersonal. This love scintillates in the smallest microcosm and explodes at the level of the macrocosm. And then the last one. <clears throat> and then the last is God is love. Love is the form of the formless the feeling of the infinite. When you love God, you are loving life, you are loving love itself, and love becomes unboundedly exponential. You will be in ecstasy. Mm. Yeah. Mary, <clears throat> so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. It really is um, just such an incredible uh, article, and it's one of many, as you know. So um, the, the link is on the bottom of this. Uh, screen if you want to get a copy that's it's available in digital and print digital if you want to save some trees and uh, print if you like to hold things in your hands and are obsessed with books like uh, me so like myself yeah um, so Mary you know as I was saying um, you know one of the beautiful things about I think the way you express bhakti is this kind of way that it it transcends tradition in a certain kind of way mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about that you know non sectarian aspect of bhakti? Yeah, I guess so. Um, well, I I think that, you know, I first started um, getting into a love relationship with the universe as a child, um, you know, just as a, a way of escaping my childhood a little bit, and also because I had been um, raised Catholic early on. So there was that kind of orientation toward the form and toward of toward love and, and, um, and um, seeking uh, and, and longing, yeah. sort of like pouring all my longing into this, this abstract form, which is God. And later on, I began to use just loving the breath as a way to adore the universe and adore the absolute, since there's many texts later on I found that you know, say that the breath is the absolute. Prana is, is the supreme principle yeah. You know, a good kind of supreme principle that we can get a hold of. Yeah. And um, so for me, obviously, there. once I start to um, get into this method of relationship with the divine, then I find that I can read Sufism or uh, mystical Judaism or uh, shamanism and, or many different kinds of uh, cultural ways that this has been going on. You can see it in many different cultures, but once you get you get the knack of the love, mm. then you get to um, uh, taste the different flavors and nectars from the different traditions. That's been my Yeah, that's experience. so that's interesting. So it's almost like you have to be captured by the the quality of bhakti in order to see bhakti in these different yeah. expressions. Yeah. And I feel that way. I think that's been true of my own experience of where um, I feel like as I, bhakti has been something that's cultivated sort of externally to the representations of it that we find in different traditions, but having been moved in a certain kind of way, then you're able to sort of extract that yeah. nectar from the expressions, whether it's in a text yes. or, in a, you know, a treatise or a, or a teaching. Um, and I want to go back to what you said about prana, because I actually, 
I love the way, and this you were actually the first person I think I ever met who taught, who sort of spoke about this as, as really falling in love with your own breath and with the prana. Um, because like you were saying, it is so, it's something that you can really grasp onto. It's somatic, yeah. right? So it is embodied in that way. And, and it's a, and it's almost, and, and then also it, it invites you to cultivate a relationship with something that otherwise might be so unconscious. Yeah. Because most people are just completely, they're not paying attention to their breath. Yeah. And, and their breath is obviously so reflective of a, their state of mind and what's going on. Yeah. Um, so can you talk about what kind of changes um, in the experience, in experience of life or experience of spiritual practice, when the breath becomes a friend in that way or the breath becomes a lover? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, for one thing, I love what you said about how we don't pay attention to it. It's the fundamental foundation of everything, and so we sort of ignore it, you know. Yeah. And uh, But once we recognize it, you're, it's the most simple, basic thing, and, and it, is, it also is, uh, in the form of prana, it pervades the whole universe, including the animate and the inanimate. Yeah. So you're getting in touch with some underlying uh, unity, um, medium. And um, I think of the breath, when I first started, I, it's like a delivery system for love, okay? So if I love my prana, okay, then I'm, uh, the and I breathe deeply, I'm bringing deep love into myself, and it's also getting into my cells as neurochemistry. But then what happens too is that your relationship with the divine if you call it that, is um, very intimate. What could be more intimate than the breath, which actually enters into the very cells and makes them work. And so it's this deep intimacy that I love. And as we go into the tantric stuff um, that uh, Jacob teaches, we, we also start to follow the breath to its source, uh, both at the end of the inhalation and the exhalation. So now you're getting to really touch the supreme principle through the breath. It delivers you to the supreme principle really easily. And that's the great thing, What you know, all of this with the bhakti and the breathing is basically, I am a lazy person and I want to look for something that You're really, not. yes I am. I, you know, it's a paradox, but I'm, you know, I don't want to do any work, but it's not that hard. I mean, you're breathing anyway, you know, so you link to the breath, this, this, uh, the emotion of love. And it's uh, when, you do that, and then you want to whisper sweet nothings to the prana, so you give it the, you call it by its name, and then you could get, if you don't mind, very sexy with it. You know? <laughs> we don't mind, Mary. <laughs> because, you know, it's interpenetrating, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's the kind of lover that never leaves you, right? Your, your breath. And uh, if you do personify it, um, it it uh, really takes on a personality I've found mm. Mm. and um, sort of a deep, um, attentive lover, yeah. um, if I may say. And so, you know, just do it and um, don't be afraid. Because, and I was, one of the uh, things in that article um, is from the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says to Arjuna, you know, offer me a leaf, some water in your hand, a flower, I'll accept it, meaning, Look, God or the divine, the universe doesn't need anything, but for a relationship, offer something. Mm -hmm. And then at the one of those chapters, he says, some offer their exhalation into the inhalation and their inhalation into the exhalation. Mm -hmm. So you can make your breath an offer, okay? How do you make your inhalation an offer? Offer to receive it. Because when you take in <laughs> the divine, you know, I mean, <laughs> so... The, the being receptive, you know, and maybe the the universe wants to go deep. Can you take it in, you know? And so being receptive is an offering, and then you, you give back. And it becomes this beautiful way to meditate that, that includes um, eros and, mm. uh, and uh, of course, makes you um, feel connected. Wow. That, I love that, that being receptive is an offering. That's yeah. really beautiful. By the way, I should also mention that, you know, shameless plug here, but Mary's teaching a course called The Art of Breathing that begins in the beginning of April. And you can tell how, how much, you know, experiential knowledge uh, she has about this particular 
um, uh, subject. So, you know, check that out. It'll be, it'll be coming up. So Mary, um, you know, you're talking all about this breath and I just feel call, you're sort of calling us to do a little bit of breath practice. Yes. Would you lead us through a short breath practice? Sure. Okay. Okay. So one thing I like to do when I do spend a moment, you know, in my, uh, you know, boudoir with my divine lover. I'm going to just go there. Okay? <laughs> go, go there. Just do it, you know. So, but you want to have um, a posture, which is an attitude. But again, gently bring your shoulder blades back and down and together and bring your ears back over your shoulders. And what I'm going to ask you to do is reach with the top of the back of your head up. So we're lengthening our brain stem, so to speak. And, um, you know, this part of the brain is responsible for breath. Uh, automatically unless we do uh, conscious breathing right so we're going to lengthen that part of our brain which is the, the in our neck and we'll let's start with uh, you may know that I really like this kind of breathing which is the cooling breath and what we're gonna do is purse our lips and breathe in through pursed lips and we're gonna be as wine tasters and when you taste wine you run the wine over your tongue with oxygen to get the nuance of it. Maybe prana, maybe breath has a flavor that we've been not paying attention to because it's been there all along. So let's exhale, purse the lips, and inhale across the tongue, breathing. You'll feel the coolness like this. Now hold it in. And then release it. Very nice. And just experience the change in consciousness that happened just from that. And one of the things we do, especially when uh, Jacob teaches us more about Tantra, is the relishing and the appreciation of our states. So we're going to do that again and to purse the lips to relish the prana. This gives honor to the prana, recognition to its flavor. I want you to taste it. Okay, you're going to feel it, you're going to hear it. Let's do breathe in. How refreshing. Hold it in. And exhaling. Beautiful. Very nice. Relishing that. <clears throat> I'm going to do one more. And on our exhale, we're going to notice if it feels like the exhalation is ascending, okay? Because love, and this time when we when we relish the, the flavor and the feel of the breath, that's a form of love, okay? We're expanding our notion of love. We're not putting it in a little box. Love is so many things, so many kinds of appreciation. And when we exhale, we're going to notice if we feel a sense of ascent, because love is also a vehicle of ascent. It goes up. It is positivity. Okay, so let's give it a shot. We're going to get our head back. When you bring your head back, imagine that you're uh, making your crown of your head parallel with the sky. Okay, and now purse your lips and uh, just taste the deliciousness of the prana. And we can hold it. When we breathe out, we're going to see if it's an elevator. Exhale. Any way you like. Very nice. And we can just gently open our eyes and get back to uh, just being that we're, mm. I think, permeated a little bit by yeah. simple bliss. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Mary. Okay. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I don't feel ready to talk yet okay. after that. I, <laughs> I feel a little stoned on my breath. <laughs> That's what I like. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, uh, this has been fabulous. And um, so before we close, is there anything, um, other kind of key aspects of, of bhakti or, you know, or the associated topics of kind of love and devotion that maybe you mentioned in the article or, or things that you that just come up for you as important to reflect on as we explore this you know topic of bhakti yeah well i think that um one of the main 
uh, tools, if we will, for this to have these, this experience, and that can be with you all the time, is mantra or word or the name. Mm -hmm. And learning to love the name, okay? It's, the, it's just a love object. I would think that we create a form and we love it in order to develop and cultivate love. Mm -hmm. and, and as I mentioned, love is an ascending vehicle. So it brings you to, you know, the, brings you home, really. So what you want to do is pick a name or a form, but it would be good to have a name because a name you can repeat to yourself as you walk around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you chant, you're going to come with a Rama and, and a Krishna and, and a Om Namah Shivaya and Hamsa, which gets even more subtle. And so whatever the name is, as you as you integrate it with your breath, you adore it, mm -hmm. okay? And um, then you're walking around with this love that you're not looking for it outside. And I find that what then happens is that, you know, you, people come to you and you know, you're, you're, you become a source, right? Mm -hmm. You're not actually seeking for someone else uh, to love you. And, uh, but you still get love all the time. Mm -hmm. That's been my experience. Yeah. Yeah. So with regards to the name is, you know, the name that you would choose or that would choose you, it's something that expresses the divine or something expansive in some way, right? And so I wouldn't just be like, for example, the name of, you know, a wine bottle or something or a wine glass, or I'm yeah. just like, re you know, repeating the name of wine, wine, wine. <laughs> that ought to get you I've some I've been wine. taking a break from wine, so that's why it's on my mind. <laughs> if you're in a restaurant, then wine will come. Right, wine. but like, but there's something about the the kind of name, right? <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, you know, um, we, I'm not a, the real expert on the um, power of the phonemes uh, right. that, that many of your Sanskrit teachers can talk about, and yeah. also the, those uh, scholars and practitioners that you have uh, in your cohort. But um, I think that, you know, because we being uh, ca raised Catholic, there's a, a whole tradition of the name, the, G the holy name. Right. And, you know, there, we even have in our, uh, our uh, commandments, do not take the name in vain. Mm. Um, and so that means there's something holy about it. And then we also have a prayer, which is our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That, you know, we just say that to ourselves, but it has no meaning yeah. until we think about it. Or we it. interpret it as kind of, kind of a, 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 a weird sort of... Punitive. Yeah, a weird yeah. level. Like, don't take the name of it. It's meant to be like, you know, a bent to castigate people who say, oh my God, or yes, something. Yes, yes. When really, that's very interesting. I've never thought about it that way. That's so interesting. I, I, I know. I, and I think, you know, with, when we do um, our breathing and then the oath course that we're going to talk about the power of words and how they kind of have they dissipate the power of words dissipates if we uh, don't have enough silence and we don't really yeah. drill down yeah. uh, so anyway the holy name there's something about god's name in all the different traditions so of course if a guru gives you um an, uh, a name to say which is an, a mantra that's a, something to take to heart yeah. Um, but you're going to be attracted to, to certain, like Guru Om is one. But uh, I've been playing, I know I, I, I'm a flirt, but I've, I've gone to Aham Brahmasmi lately, which is I am Brahman. And Bra is the expansion, you know. So Brahman to me means the Big Bang. So when I say Aham Brahmasmi, I'm saying I'm the Big Bang, motherfucker. <laughs> right? <laughs> Sorry. So I'm just saying, when I walk around, aham brahmasmi, you know, I, I feel good about that. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> so I, just, I am the big bang. Yeah, that's right. What else could you be? What else could you Look be? at you, yeah. big bang. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, so um, Mary, it's been a delight. I'm trying to keep these under 30 minutes. Yeah, I haven't been doing a very good job this whole week, but it's we're looking at, we're right close to the end. So I just want to... Um, thank Mary for joining me on on um, on day number three of our of our lovely Bhakti um, celebration of the journal Tarka. Again, this is um, the journal here, of course. Obviously, you've been seeing it the whole time. Um, but if you're interested in getting a, a copy for yourself, um, you can go to embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. Uh, there's print that's available that will be sent out, um, you know, to your address. We can send internationally as well. Um, and then there's also, um, as soon as you get the print edition, you also automatically get the digital 
autumn, you know, as soon as you order it. And you can also just order the digital uh, as well. You can, there's also subscriptions. And if you are associated with a bookstore or with a yoga studio and you'd like to carry the Tarka Journal, um, please reach out to us at hello at embodiedphilosophy.com and we'll be uh, sure to uh, help you out with that. So um, once again, thank you so much, Mary. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. And I enjoyed it. We'll see you tomorrow with uh, Miles Neal. And uh, I'm sorry, Kavita Chanayan is tomorrow. Kavita will be uh, with me to talk about um, her contribution to the Tarka Journal. And then on Friday, I'll be with Miles. Uh, he contributed an article about pilgrimage, which will be a really um, interesting thing to talk about in the context of that larger uh, topic of bhakti. Mm -hmm. So I hope you'll join me tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and then on Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody.